Dr. Emmanuel Taban is a remarkable man with an extraordinary story. Here's Masake Kana to explain. He came down on Thursday, the 13th of August, and he stood at the kitchen table and he said to me, Dom, I can't breathe. You need to take me to the doctor, I need oxygen. So I just left everything, picked up my keys, put him in the car and sped off. Frantic with worry, Dominique DeSantos rushed her husband, Jose, to the emergency unit at the Midstream Medi Clinic. He had been battling COVID-19 for a few days. When we arrived and they'd taken him in, they said to me that he has less than 5% chance of survival. A lung scan indicated that Jose's lungs were severely compromised. I went back to the emergency and I laid on the bed and that's all I can remember. That's all I can remember. Jose lost consciousness and was taken to the COVID-19 intensive care unit. He was in critical condition. It was here at the Midstream Medi Clinic that the DeSantos family's path crossed with that of Dr. Emmanuel Taban. Dr. Emmanuel Taban is a pulmonologist and lung specialists are at the forefront in the battle against COVID-19. He assessed DeSantos in the ICU and immediately phoned a despairing Dominique. And he said, look, I'm going to do a procedure on your husband. I haven't lost a patient yet, but this is a new procedure and I'm going to do it. He then performed the procedure. Dominique waited anxiously at home. Early the next morning, news came from the hospital. Jose was better. That day I knew that what Dr. Debung had done had brought him back to us. And I think it was within five days he was off the ventilator and he was able to breathe on his own. Dr. Taban's work with critically ill COVID patients is groundbreaking and revolutionary, but what makes his work even more remarkable is that the odds were stacked against him to even be in this position. He was born in 1979 on a mud floor of a hut in a small village in South Sudan. His mother was a single parent. My childhood was a happy one. We did have enough in the village. We have enough food. For me, I was very happy. I grew up as a happy child. But it was short-lived. South Sudan was in the process of gaining independence from Sudan, and in a bloody civil war, hundreds of thousands were killed, and millions of people were displaced. Emmanuel's family eventually moved to Juba, the capital city of South Sudan. When he was 14, he was arrested by the military. Then I got put in the White House, and they think that I was a spy for the rebels. The White House is a notorious prison in Juba, known for all kinds of atrocities and human rights violations. And I spent about almost six weeks in the White House, and that's when I got tortured, and so it was a very horrible experience. After his release, he was sent north from Juba to Khartoum and forced to convert to Islam. He eventually escaped from a religious center and fled over the border to Eritrea. After being imprisoned there for six months, he decided to attempt the near impossible for a 16-year-old street child. He was set on walking 2,800 kilometers from Eritrea through Ethiopia via Addis Ababa to an uncle of his in Nairobi, Kenya. Against all odds, he survived the journey. When he eventually made it to his uncle's house in Nairobi, he thought he had found a safe refuge, but he was sorely disappointed. His uncle refused him sanctuary and suggested that he should rather go to a UN refugee camp. I was crying, I was angry, and that was the moment then I decided I need to find my own identity. So I just knew that I was alone in the world and have to face the reality by myself. Determined to succeed in life and inspired by the words manufactured in South Africa on a Coke can, young Emmanuel headed for South Africa. His journey took him from Kenya through Tanzania into Mozambique. There, he found himself alone on a deserted road. Then I think that time I actually feel so free. For me, I always, always very free when there's nothing. To be honest, I'm never afraid of animals but I'm very afraid of human beings because animals will never hurt you, but human beings will. And that's what I've learned in South Sudan. In Mozambique, Emmanuel eventually got help from a Catholic group, the Kamboni missionaries. They assisted him to get to Johannesburg via Zimbabwe, where they took him in, helped him to matriculate, and his marks were good enough to get him admitted to Medunsa to study medicine. Then a chance meeting at the university's medical library changed the course of Dr. Taban's life forever. 
He wanted to take out a reference book and a friendly librarian helped him. The next day, he saw the same girl assisting in the ICU. He didn't know she was a physiotherapy student who worked for extra money in the library. So he saw me in the ICU and then I was confused because he thought I was a librarian. And then, and I saw him and I said, where's my book? I hope you took it back in the right time. And, uh, and so we started chatting. And from there, of course, here we are. The Extremely happy, the rest of history. They were married soon after and both graduated. Today they have three lovely children. After further studies, Dr. Taban also qualified as a pulmonologist. And what character traits would you say attracted you to him? Wow, so many, actually. <laughs> I think the drive, he is so driven. Um, you know, uh, the, the ambition, the passion he has for his work. Um, the compassion with which he treats his patients. This became even more evident when the pandemic arrived in South Africa. While Dr. Taban was treating an ever-increasing number of COVID-19 patients here in the ICU, something revolutionary occurred to him. He was intrigued as to why some COVID patients who initially responded well to ventilation deteriorated after a few days and then died. He decided to do a bronchoscopy to find out what was going on in the lungs, although the World Health Organization had advised against this for COVID patients. During a bronchoscopy, a thin lighted tube is inserted into the lungs to inspect the airways. To his surprise, Dr. Taban found several mucus plugs. Inside the lungs, mucus can build up and can become thick and hardened. It then acts like a plug, blocking airways and rendering ventilators ineffective. Dr. Taban decided to remove the plugs he saw. We sucked them out. It was difficult. It took about two hours and a half. We sucked them out and the oxygen level went back to normal. And we were able to take the patient out of life support after two days. So I thought that was incidental. I did the second one. The third one was exactly the same thing. Dr. Taban was the first in the world to try this life-saving treatment on COVID patients and has just published an academic study on his findings. When we visited him at his rooms, we noticed several trophies on his desk. They were all from grateful patients whom he had given a second chance through his use of the therapeutic bronchoscopy technique. I love that it says, thank you, Dr. Taban, for saving my life. And among the many who are grateful that the boy from South Sudan had survived a near impossible journey through Africa are Jose and Dominique de Santos. I'm feeling like a sports car. I'm fit and I'm full of life. To me, it was a miracle. I think Dr. Taban is amazing. Oh, yes, definitely. The new procedure and the new intervention did save my life. Thank you for watching our stories here online. And please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.